Martha McCallum, anchor and executive editor of The Story on our great network, is with me now. Martha, uh, three hours nearly. This is in quite a busy day, Harris, and I've been watching all of you and your great coverage today. Uh, there are a lot of implications here, obviously, politically and legally for keeping this can of worms open for the Biden's legal troubles. And, you know, there, this judge is fascinating to listen to because basically she objected when they walked in there, you know, and, and they didn't want this uh, amicus brief from Jason Smith to be part of this. They thought that was out of bounds. And we're going to talk to Jason Smith. He's the um, chairman for the House Ways and Means Committee who sent this letter to the judge saying, hold on, let's make sure what we're doing here is specific to these charges and, and leaves open the door, which David Weiss, the attorney in Delaware, told everyone was still open for an ongoing investigation. And I think this judge um, rejected what the Biden attorneys had hoped was going to be blanket immunity for anything that Hunter may come across, uh, you know, basically for the rest of his life or certainly for the period that has been under investigation. So um, she basically said, no, 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 that is not how this is going to work. They're making a second plea agreement now. And we're also learning that she's asking him about the companies that he worked for. Can you name those companies overseas? According to some of the reporting on this, he said, Barisma. Mm -hmm. CEFC. Um, this this is far from over, and there's no doubt that the revelations that have come out of James Comer's committee and just the, the testimony of these two whistleblowers. For those who say this is all political, you know these individuals came forward um, on their own volition to say, "Look, I was working on all of this. I saw things that were potentially felonious, and they should not be overlooked." And then we were we were told, "Poof!" That this whole thing was going away. So. It has not gone away, is what no, we're learning right now. It hasn't. And I want to add to some of that reporting, um, because I had brought this in from one competitor, and I know that, that it is being covered more widely now. Uh, Judge Noriega in the courtroom, as she was, Martha, and you were talking about this, as she was asking Hunter Biden reportedly about his business dealings, C, uh, CEFC, the Chinese energy company, um, I never saw anything on his resume that had anything to do with energy um, expertise, but... In two different countries, he was he was working it. But the judge eventually reportedly asked Hunter Biden, you did know that you owed tax money, right? Biden said, yes, your honor. Martha? Mm. Yeah, um, and that is, I think, what has been brought together for this second plea deal agreement, which is basically just saying, look, we're going to deal with these tax charges. You owed over $100,000. You didn't pay. That can be part of this agreement. Um, she wasn't happy with the gun agreement, mm -hmm. it appears. Um, that may be part of the deal that kind of goes by the wayside, him filling out that form inaccurately because it asks if you're taking any drugs, and he did not, was not forthcoming about the fact that he was during that time period. So basically, it, this just leaves open a lot of room for further jeopardy for him. You know, one of the big questions that I've asked all along in this is how was he doing all of this? business with Ukrainian and Russian and other country companies, countries without having FARA, um, you know, the, the foreign agency allow him to do this kind of work. Remember, that is what Paul Manafort got slammed for, mm -hmm. that he hadn't registered as a foreign agent to work with all of these countries. And, you know, that's a huge question here that I think has been kind of swept under the rug because other people have gone to prison for that. Martha, it's Emily as we approach a presidential election around the corner, and as you, one of our top political analysts here on the channel, um, my question involves how you feel this will be spun and how you feel the party and the left-wing media will continue framing this. This state judge was appointed by President Trump, and it seems to me there are already multiple threads where any type of credibility is attempted to be pierced because of that reason, because of that association, as well underscoring the haste with which this plea deal was sort of trying to be achieved in part was to have it be concluded before the upcoming election. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's becoming a, a very thick, soupy pudding that they are wading through at this point, because you've got all the concerns about Joe Biden's age. You've got these legal concerns, which are very real. We've put a lot of meat on the bones over the last couple of weeks 
um, Commerce Committee has over the course of this. So, so there is a lot more political peril here. Doug Schoen on our air with you guys, I think just a little while ago, or maybe with Harris, said, you know, this is a good day for Gavin Newsom. I mean, you're going to see a lot of heads kind of perking up you know, raising their hand, I'm available if this whole thing blows apart. <laughs> yeah, that was and last it, you hour. Know, and it, it's, um, <laughs> it, it's worth thinking about. You know, I think there is a lot of nervousness among voters, clearly. 60% of them don't want Biden to run. So, yeah. you know, you've got a lot of concern. This is not, this is a very far from a slam dunk for this incumbent president. So this is a very, very close election process. Lots going to happen between now and then. And this is going to make other Democrats look at this and say, is this is this worth it? All right. A little bit about Doug federal... said too, I think he said that Republicans see this as being about Joe Biden, whereas Democrats see this as being about Hunter Biden. Martha. Yeah, I mean, that that's what you hear a lot. Right. I, mean, I was talking to Juan Williams about this yesterday on the story. And he's saying, well, he was a you know, he was a drug addict. This was a difficult time for him. But it all depends on what, you know, arguments being made, because at the time when the questions were raised, what is he doing on these boards without expertise for either of these areas? He's obviously the only thing he had to offer them was some proximity to the vice president um, and, you know, some awareness, at least to share with them. That was the only thing that he could have shared with them. So, I mean, whenever we were told that, oh, no, he has lots of experience, tons of experience. He's a brilliant guy. But now everybody's falling back to, oh, well, he was just a drug addict at that time. So, you know, we just have to feel sorry for him. We feel bad for him. His family feels bad for him. And that's all fine and good. All families go through these sorts of things, right? But the problem is when the nexus of that is dealing with foreign countries, some that are adversarial to the United States, while your father is serving as vice president of the United States. That combination is way more than just let's back off, you know, that this guy's had a lot of trouble. Well, Martha, you brought up that we have concentrated on the gun charge and, and not enough on the money, and, and the judge is apparently leaning in on that portion about, you know, the dealings that he was doing with different countries. But I just want to say this about Judge Noriega, because, you know, we haven't said much about this federal district judge, Mary Ellen Noriega. She's an appointee of former President Donald Trump, um, and she's presiding uh, over this case that the Justice Department brought against President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. But when it comes to guns, I, I found this detail. Last August, this particular judge presided over the case of a 34-year-old defendant, Jeremy Johnson of Wilmington, Delaware. She sentenced him to five years in prison for possessing a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. So she may have wanted to take another, you know, look at that, that drug, drug part of the, excuse me, the gun part of the plea deal as well, just based on some recent experience and recent adjudication that she's done. Yeah, and it, it may, yes, so she set a precedent in her courtroom with that. Um, it makes her, it's incumbent upon her to look at both of them and see if there are parallels in those two cases that she wants to consider. Um, it's also possible that that gun part of the issue kind of takes a second stage to the larger tax issue, which now they're, it looks like they're framing it down to 2014 to 2019. Um, so anything that comes after that obviously would be open to further, further potential litigation. But remember, mm -hmm. all of this came up, you know, when the laptop was found, this started this ball rolling. And before that existed, there wasn't a lot of evidence for people to dig into. And so that was a very difficult moment for the entire Biden family because it has brought out all of what has happened here, payments that were made to nine different family members, which I know you have mentioned earlier. So this is a it's a big story and we kind of have to, you know, slice pies of it to look at it one piece at a time. But we also have to remember that it is part of a very large pie. Um, all right, Martha, we are going to let you go because the big story comes on at 3 p.m. Eastern with you, the story with Martha McCallum, and I know you have to go Thanks, get ready, guys. but we appreciate you being with us so very much. Hey, everyone, I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.